So my topic is how do we fortify faith in these faithless times? Uh, that is to say, how do we strengthen our iman in the face of such disbelief in the modern world? So the, the answer is actually quite simple. Um, and the answer is by dedicating ourselves to seeking knowledge. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. So there's a reason why it's an obligation. There's a reason why he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said everything in the dunya is a person. He said that everything in the world is a person except three things, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teacher and student of ilm, of knowledge. And there's a reason why the only thing in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to ask him for an increase in is knowledge. Which also happens to be the Zaytuna College school motto. Some universities they have uh, like fiat looks that there be light from the gospel, or looks at veritas, light and uh, truth. That's truth with a capital T. You know, but these other schools no longer teach traditional religion, nor even objective truth. Now they teach that truth is relative, and scripture is archaic and irrelevant, even oppressive. But scripture cannot be ignored, so it must be radically reinterpreted in light of the current zeitgeist, or prevailing culture. So let me say a few more things about the state of modern academia. Uh, colleges and universities in the West, in particular, are becoming uh, total disasters, absolutely toxic, for people of traditional faith. The so-called higher learning academia is becoming fundamentally anti-theistic. So at first, academia was theistic, right? So like Harvard and Yale and uh, Georgetown, these actually started as Christian seminaries. Education used to be sought primarily for the sake of God. There was a theistic worldview, a metaphysic that was based on scripture and tradition. And then academia became atheistic. It was an atheistic turn at some point. Uh, so there's no God, and if you believe in God, that's your business, just keep God out of here, out of the institution. But now, in this postmodern, -mod, post post-truth world, academia has become anti-theistic. Right? which really means two things. Number one, the belief in God and practice of religion need to go. Just throw it all out. Or, if you insist on believing in God, uh, that's okay, but you must reject traditional religion. You must change your beliefs for the sake of hurt feelings. Otherwise, you are a patriarchal misogynist, homophobic, transphobic, regressive bigot. There are still a few Catholic colleges that continue to, you know, keep it real, as they say. Like Thomas Aquinas College, I think they make their faculty and students uh, pledge that they are committed to the magisterium, which is the traditional teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church, I think Papa Maria <laughs> University as well. You know, at Zaytuna, if you're not familiar with Zaytuna, Zaytuna College is the first ever accredited Muslim college in North America. Our founders, our pillars of the community, our fundamental metaphysic and worldview are rooted in traditional Islam, Sunni Islam. And we teach both the Islamic and Western tradition, as well as both canons, so seminal texts in both traditions. So students, they read, uh, they read Bazali, they read Bitemiya, they read Suyuti, they also read Aristotle, Plotinus, and Aquinas. We teach the trivium which is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So these are the liberal arts, right? Um, you know, when people hear the phrase liberal arts, they often get the wrong ideas. They hear the word liberal and they think the political left. They think Joe Biden or Beto O'Rourke. They hear arts and they think underwater basket weaving. 
So the word liberal comes from the Latin for freedom. So these are the freeing tools, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So these are tools that free our minds. They allow us to think critically. They allow us to think outside the box. These are the most powerful tools that one can possibly possess. Why? Because they can move the world. The most influential people in history were masters of these tools. As one of my teachers said, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the most logical human being. He was always grammatically correct and was the most rhetorically powerful person who ever lived. So language is very powerful. And advocates of the current zeitgeist understand this. If they can control our language, then they can control our ideas. Stanford University just released something called the Harmful Language Guide. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Stanford University, it is now considered harmful to say the word American. You can't say American. You can't say immigrant. You can't use expressions like beating a dead horse. You ever heard this expression? Because apparently if you say beating a dead horse, you're more prone to abusing animals. You can't say the word landlord or manpower or stupid or homeless person or prostitute. <clears throat> You have to say a person engaged in sex work, and we wouldn't want to offend the prostitutes. The tragic aspect of this is that these free tools are seldom taught anymore. And people don't really value them anymore. There's a reason for this. The elites who imagine themselves in control of this world don't want people to think for themselves. They want people to become cogs in some corporate machine. They put it into our heads that unless we study STEM or their version of the humanities and social sciences, then not only will we be financially impoverished, we will also be socially outcast, canceled, as they say. So this is what the shaitan does. He threatens us with poverty. They want to destroy the nuclear family because individuals are easier to control uh, than family units. People are more likely to acquiesce to tyranny if they are alone, as opposed to having a spouse and children. So they want men and women to hate each other. This is cultural Marxism, and this is happening right now. This is an epidemic. We have things like the Big Tao movement, men going their own way, men swearing off women. We have incels, men who are involuntarily celibate, can't find spouses. And we have the rise of radical and militant feminism amongst women, where they are taught by their college professors to denounce marriage. Marriage uh, as being oppressive, even a form of slavery. Because everything for these people is power dynamics. Right? They make the false assumption that human beings are constantly motivated by power and nothing else. It's a very cynical worldview. These postmodern philosophies bifurcate the world into two classes, the oppressed and the oppressor. That's cultural Marxism. And ironically, those who are often labeled as oppressed are actually the oppressors, and vice versa. So Toba and Shukur and Tawadur are thrown out the window. These are the three of the greatest what we consider to be theological virtues. Toba is repentance. Shukur is gratitude. Tawadur is humility. So now Toba is replaced with living your authentic self. Right? Hey, just accept yourself. Right? There's nothing wrong with you. If you don't think there's anything wrong with you, why would you make Toba? Shukur is replaced with self-victimization. Right? Shukur is gratitude. But if you're constantly told that you're a victim, why would you be grateful? Grateful for what? I'm a victim, right? And Tawadur, humility, is replaced by off-the-charts narcissism. The elites controlling this current zeitgeist want to domesticate men. They want men to work from home, to marry their computers, to get fat, and to eat bugs. Why? Because traditional masculinity is apparently toxic. They want women out in the workforce, not at home managing a household or raising children. And women who prefer to take care of the home 
are often shamed and accused of, quote, internalizing their patriarchy. <clears throat> In fact, Rockefeller admitted that he supported feminism for financial reasons. The American government can now tax the other half of the country that wasn't previously working. It was a big money grab. So in the future, people will wake up in the morning, you know, alone in their rented pods, getting into their expensive, climate-friendly electric cars that the government can shut off remotely, and go to some job and be a cog in a corporate machine. What a wonderful life. So my advice is don't fall victim to these things. Our tradition works, our Islamic tradition works. It is tried and tested for 1400 years. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to the advice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to the words of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When a man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, qul li fi islami qawlan la as'alu anhu ahadan ghayrak. Tell me something unique about this religion. And the Prophet said to him, very short, concise, beautiful, but deep. Qul amantu billah, thumma staqim. Say, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be upright upon that. So this is why nihilism is on the rise. Nihilism is this belief that there's no meaning to anything, there's no meaning, meaning to life. This is why people are depressed, people are drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness, but it's okay, just amuse yourself on social media, just entertain yourself endlessly with your technology. Uh, Neil Postman, he talked about this in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. This was a few years ago, but he said that religion, politics, and education are all becoming entertainment. We need entertainment to dull our sense of meaninglessness. This is why we now have a 24-hour news cycle. This is why now we have uh, social media addiction, like TikTok and Instagram. People spend hours and hours a day on these things. It's a quick dopamine hit. The average TikTok video is what, 11 seconds. You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Next thing you know, it's an hour later, two hours later, three hours later, right? This is why we have uh, a pandemic of internet pornography addiction. You know, a 10-year-old child today will see more sexually explicit images in 10 minutes than a 70-year-old man who lived pre-internet during his entire life. In 10 minutes, a 10-year-old child. So our brains are being rewired. These things clash with our fitra, our natural disposition. The result of this is depression on a massive scale. But rather than seek out our true purpose in life, we fill the void with entertainment, with pleasure, with hedonism. What happened to modesty, to stoicism, to discipline, to piety before God? So traditional values are being replaced with just do you and get it and YOLO and do what thou wilt. So we have to take this very seriously. Seeking knowledge is all over the Quran and Sunnah. It's absolutely central to our tradition. Knowledge frees our mind and freedom is powerful. What was the very first word of the Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad It was Iqra, read, right? I saw a, <clears throat> a Christian magazine called Christianity Today. And there was, a, there was an article in this magazine written by a Christian, they're all, the, the writers are all Christian. And the, um, the name of the article was, The Greatest Book Never Read. The Greatest Book Never Read. And it was about the Bible. So here's a Christian complaining about other Christians who, who never read the Bible. And in this article he said that he went to churches at random, and he was, he asked Christians coming out of church, so these are people that not only identify as Christian, but actually go to church. And he said to them at random, can you name the four Gospels in the New Testament? Just name them. And he said 50%, 5-0%, could not even name the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People don't read. 
How many Muslims? So I actually, I actually mentioned this to one of my teachers, uh, and he said, uh, he said, you know, I, I wonder how many Muslims coming out of Salat al Jum'ah can quote one hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one hadith in Arabic. How many Muslims know the names of the surahs of the Quran? Right? If I say Surah Al An Kabut, what surah number is this? Anyone? <laughs> no? 29. <laughs> How many Muslims can properly cite iconic ayat? You know, if you ever watch a football game and you see this guy in the crowd completely drunk but holding a big banner that says John 3.16? You ever see that? John 3.16? That's, that's their verse. You know, their sort of Christian theology in a nutshell. We have a verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Right? Our prophetology in a nutshell. What surah is this? What ayah number is this? Very seldom of us know these things. Ayatul Kursi. Where is this in the Quran? Huh? Baqarah 255. Mashallah. That was kind of an easy one, though. <laughs> How many Muslims can name the children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Or explain the difference between Farad and Wajid and Sunnah Mustahab. These are basics. So, Ilm is Nur. Knowledge is light, and light is guidance. And Arabic is a sacred language. So it's not an accident that if you rearrange the triliteral root letters of the word Ilm, you get Amal, action. Because a true Alim, a true knower, puts his Ilm into Amal, his knowledge into practice. These terms are related. You know, there are Jewish professors of Islamic studies with double PhDs teaching all around the country. Are these ulama? Of course not. They don't put their knowledge into practice. Now rearrange these letters again and you get lama, which means light, luster, radiance, resplendence, brilliance. It's ajib. Knowledge plus action equals light. The word iman comes from the root amina, right, which means to be safe and secure. The word iman is a form for infinitive. Form for in Arabic denotes causation. So iman billah, or a mu'min billah, is one who makes himself safe uh, billah, by means of God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-mu'min, one of his Asma al husna the ultimate cause of safety and security, the giver of iman. So ilm, knowledge, increases our iman. And I actually prefer the word confidence as a translation of iman, rather than the word faith. The English word faith, unfortunately, has been sullied by the new atheist movement. <clears throat> they defined faith as belief without evidence, right? So, belief without evidence. And unless you say, I have faith in myself or something, or I have faith in Bill Gates. But if you say, I have faith in God, they say, oh, faith in God. And so they set up this false dichotomy with faith in God on one side and reason and science and knowledge on the other as if faith and knowledge are diametrically opposed, as if faith and knowledge are somehow incompatible or antithetical. And so many people, unwittingly indoctrinated by their rhetoric, think that they have to make a choice between knowledge and faith. So they choose knowledge and abandon their religious tradition. Right? And so they become atheists and agnostics and deists, which means I believe in a creator God, but I don't believe in a religion. Or none. They become nuns, not Catholic nuns. Some of them become Catholic nuns, but not really. N-O-N-E-S. These are people who check none of the above when it comes to religion. So I say use the word confidence rather than faith. What does confidence mean? Come from the Latin, con, with, fides, faith. It's the same meaning, but it doesn't carry the baggage of the word that the word faith does. So if you say to an atheist, are you a man of faith? They say, no, no, no. Faith is for people who don't think. But if you say, are you a man of confidence? Oh, yes. It's the same thing. Here's the point. Everyone has confidence in something. The Quran does not entertain atheism. There's no such thing as atheism. 
In the Quranic worldview, everybody worships something. The atheist has confidence in the chef at the restaurant, right? <clears throat> that the chef won't poison him with spoiled food. The atheist has confidence in the pilot of his airplane, that he won't crash the airplane. The atheist has confidence in the in the <clears throat> in the uh, the uh, the architects and engineers of the elevator he's about to get, to, to get into at the 50th floor of some high-rise uh, building. The atheist will claim, however, that he has good reasons for being with faith when it comes to these things, and we have good reasons for being with faith when it comes to Allah and His Messenger. This is not a uh, a belief without evidence. When we acquire knowledge, our confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger increases and becomes stronger. The atheist uh, believes in, so the past is great. We don't have access to the past. But if you ask an atheist, what do you think about this historical event in the past? He'll give his response. He'll give his, his, his opinion. That's technically Iman bil ghayb. What did our master Ibrahim salam, say to his people? We have to read the Quran. So his speech is transhistorical. In other words, the speech of the Quran is relevant for all times. Okay, this is timeless. There are timeless ibar, timeless lessons in the uh, sacred narratives, the qasas of the Quran. These are not meaningless fairy tales, as the Kufar say. Have you really considered what you worship? Ibrahim is telling his people, have you really considered what you worship? So one of our scholars, Imam al-Razi, he says in his tafsir that these verses are one of the strongest proofs against theological taqlid and for istidlal. So make a note of these terms. What is theological taqlid? It is blind conformance. It is uncritical belief. It is following someone without due inquiry. It is to believe without evidence. So here we can actually use the new atheist's false definition of iman as an accurate definition of theological taqlid, belief without evidence. Taqlid in matters of creed or theology is unacceptable. You have to be convinced of your aqidah. You must engage in istidlal. What is istidlal? It means to seek a dalil, proofs and evidences. So in this vein, the Prophet sallam, he said, that asking good questions is half of knowledge. You have to actually believe what you claim to believe. And you should be able to even be a bit discursive in your theology. In other words, you should be able to explain and justify your beliefs, even if it's just at a basic level. We don't have to be theologians, but we have to know something. So if a teenager stops praying because his father dies, right? Or if a teenager goes off to college and stops praying, and he was just making tukli of his father. This is unacceptable. This is not real confidence. This is not real iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. We should be able to explain, if only to ourselves, why God exists and why he is one. We should be able to explain why we believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that he's a messenger of God, and why the Quran is the word of God. We might use rational and historical, linguistic, and scriptural proofs. We believe because it is rational. Belief in God is rational. And all of God's commandments have a rational component. So naql and aql, which, which is to say <clears throat> revelation and reason, cannot ultimately contradict because they come from the same source. And sometimes a rationale of a certain commandment is mentioned explicitly in sacred text. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Right? That indeed the prayer, it prevents, and fahsha usually means some type of sexual sin. Right? Indeed the prayer prevents one from sexual deviancy and wrong action. If you have to pray five times a day at different times with wudu, engaging in fahsha and munkar becomes very, very difficult. 
And Imam Al-Qurtubi and Imam Zabakhshari, they mentioned in their tafasir that the Prophet وسلم, he said of a young man who prayed but was inclined towards indecent acts, soon his prayer will prevent him from doing that. This is time tested, but we have to be patient and constant. The prayer comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we must trust the process. It works. Don't leave the prayer. Bain al kufri wa iman tarku salah. This is very important. But even here with the prayer, right, we don't know the reason for everything. Why five times a day? Why four units at Dhuhr? Three at Maghrib? Allahu Alam. At some point, we say, Aslamna. We submit. The religion is called Al Islam. It's not called Al Yaqeen or Al Ma'rifa or something like that. You know, I used to teach Arabic in the masjid, and a brother came in one time, and he said to me, in the middle of Arabic class, basic Arabic class, and he said, I have a question. I've asked numerous mullahs and mullahis and this and that. And no one can answer my question. <laughs> so, okay, so maybe I don't know if I can answer it. It's a tough question. He said, it's about wudu. So, okay. go ahead, I'll, I'll give my best shot. So this is what he said. He said, why do I have to wash my hands when I break wind? And he said, this, this issue is not allowing me to pray. I need an answer. I need a rational answer to this. And, and so I said to him, you know, Allahu Alam, no, oh, no, no, no. This is what they all say. Give me an answer. I said, okay. Um, so I said, you know, the prayer sort of prepares us the, the wudu prepares us for the prayer. It puts us in the right state of mind. No, this is what all these mullahis and mullahs. And... Give me a scientific answer. So I said, and excuse my crudeness, I said, you know, when you break wind, fecal particles fly up into the air. And whatever goes up has to land. So where are they going to land? On your hands. You put your hand in your mouth, you get sick. He said, oh, how much of love? <laughs> and I was completely joking. <laughs> And he said, okay, <laughs> all right. And I was just sitting there making dua, don't ask me why we wash our feet. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that the aqal has limitations. It has a jurisdiction, right? What, what did you have for lunch 18 days ago? Good luck. So in actual fact, submission to God is intelligent. The, the true aqal, the true intelligent one, submits to Allah. Right? Because Allah is good, Allah is God, and God is the source of all knowledge and wisdom. You know, when in the Quran we're told that when the Bani Israel were leaving uh, Egypt and they came to the Red Sea, right? They saw the, the sea in front of them, they saw Fir'aun and his Judur behind them, and they said, Inna la mudrakun, this is it, we're done. This is what their aqal suggested to them. Right? But Musa alayhi salam, what did he say? Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdeen. He said, by no means, indeed, uh, the, my Lord is with me, he will guide me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Musa alayhi salam, strike the sea with your staff. Right? And Musa alayhi salam didn't say, oh, hold on. Strike the sea with my staff. How is that going to, what do we think about? No, no, no. Immediately, he did that. Right? Samirna wa ta'ana. Why? Because he's dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the true aqil. That is rational. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Al-aqilu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'da al-mawt. Wa la'ajizu man atba'a nafsahu hawaha wa tamanna ala Allah. Abu Maqala alayhi salatu wa sallam. Ajeeb hadith. He said the intelligent one, the truly intelligent one, is the one who subdues his lower self and works for that which comes after death. Why is that intelligent? Because the afterlife is eternal. It's, it's, it's everlasting. And the un unintelligent one is the one who puts his desires, uh, who, who, who enslaves his desires to his lower self and has vain hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, there are things that we believe, like the Day of Judgment, that are supra-rational. In other words, unseen matters mentioned in sacred texts. These are called semi'iyat. But even here, I would argue, 
<clears throat> I'm sorry my, my voice is sort of, I did a, a four hour podcast today, earlier, speaking for four hours straight. So I apologize, I'll do my best inshallah. I would argue belief in the day of judgment is rational. You see, human beings constantly seek to establish justice in this world. Injustice is repugnant to us as human beings. This is innate, inherent, part of our collective consciousness as a species. We establish courts and judges and witnesses. Does anyone really believe that rapists and murderers and oppressors who are never brought to justice in this world, they just get away with it? I don't think so. If people are honest, they don't really believe that. An atheist once told me, well, I don't believe that, I believe in karma. So oh, karma, I thought you were a materialist. Karma is a metaphysical process. Who regulates and controls this process called karma? So on atheism, it is impossible to be objectively immoral. In other words, there is, uh, in other words, there can be no true right and wrong on atheism. Because atheism, atheists are materialists. They don't deal with morality. And such a worldview can lead to total social chaos. On atheism, we're just fizzing molecules. That's all we are. I'm a fizzing molecule. I'm fizzing right now. Right? We're just uh, carbon-based monkeys. We're just atoms colliding into each other. You know, imagine a stone rolling down a, a hill. A stone rolling down a hill. Atoms colliding with atoms. Colliding with atoms. Is there a moral component to this? Is this moral or immoral? No. It's just atoms colliding with atoms, fizzing molecules. If I take a knife and I stab a man in his heart, what's the difference? Atoms colliding with atoms. Murder is just a breach of subjective societal norms in atheism. It cannot be objectively wrong. There's no higher standard of morality on atheism. You know, there's a book by David Berlinsky called <clears throat> The Devil's Trap. And this book just lays to waste Dawkins' God Delusion. But people have never heard of this book, but they heard of the God Delusion. But anyway, Berlinsky in here, he quotes a philosopher uh, from a few centuries ago. And the philosopher said, a theist who believes in God, he said, imagine you have a magic button. There's a magic button. And if you press this button, all of the wealth of the world will come into your possession. But there's a catch. There's a caveat. One human being in the world will fall down and die. And it could be anybody, right? It could be your own mother. It could be a stranger in a different country. So the, the philosopher says, to whom will you entrust this button? To an atheist who doesn't believe in ultimate accountability on some day of judgment? Or to a theist who does believe in a day of judgment? So this idea that if we just get rid of religion, and turn all these churches and synagogues and mosques into Starbucks and Hooters and Chick-fil-A's, then everything's going to be okay, we'll hold hands and we'll be peaceful. No, 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 no. The main thing that is preventing people from doing harm is religion, is the fear of God. This is just a fact. That's why Imam Ghazali, he said, we should never refer to atheists as intelligent. It doesn't matter if an atheist has a 200 IQ. This belief in your creator is the apex of idiocy, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَتْ رُسُلُهُمْ أَفِي اللَّهِ الشَّكْ Allah tells us that the messengers said to their people, is there really a doubt about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the originator of the heavens and the earth, right? If I ask somebody, who, who created this phone, did this phone create itself? No, you'll say no. If I say, who, who created this microphone? Did it create itself? No. Who created this, this building? Did it create itself? No. Who created this universe? Did it create itself? Yes, okay, you're an idiot. <laughs> the universe created itself from nothing. This is what they say. Wow, the universe created itself from nothing. From nothing for nothing. This is a big metaphysical claim, a big claim. Something that did not exist prior to its creation created itself. MashaAllah, amazing. Something cannot come from nothing in nature, 
not at the Newtonian level, nor at the quantum level. Life only comes, uh, life cannot come from death. Life only comes from life. Our life comes from al hayul qayyum And this is rational. There's something else about the Aqal that's amazing. <clears throat> and just another proof of the sacredness of the Arabic language. The word Aqal comes from Aqala, which means to hobble or to control something. Right? So there's this iconic hadith of the Bedouin who came into the masjid, right? And his camel was outside running around. And the Prophet he said, whose camel is this? He said, that's my camel. I have, I have trusted Allah. And he said, I'qilha. Hobble her down. Tie her down. Then trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the function of the aql is to control both the emotions and the appetites. And Plato spoke about the tripartite division of the soul, and Plato was right about this. The rational soul, the emotive soul, and the appetitive soul. The rational soul must be in the driver's seat, as it were, while the emotions and appetites are in the back seat. The point is not to kill the emotions or appetites. That's not our tradition. You don't kick them out of the car no, emotions and appetites are healthy, right? The goal is to hobble them, to control them, to discipline them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the intellect takes precedence in our lives and this leads to a happy and fulfilled life. So there are millions of people right now in the world in major existential crisis. There are millions of people in the world right now whose entire worldview is being turned on its head by the current zeitgeist this pervasive and pernicious culture that makes them question their own common sense. Their own common sense is being questioned. Their own conscience, common sense, fundamental principles of being, language, definitions, objective truth, all of this is being challenged. And as I said, this new generation of children are steeped in nihilism, this idea that ultimately there is no objective meaning or purpose to human life. So you have to give your life meaning, any meaning that you want. That's what they say. Existence precedes essence. This is their, yani, aqida. Existence precedes essence. This is what Sartre said, a, a philosopher, French philosopher. And his consort, Simone de Beauvoir, one of the founders of modern feminism, she said, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. A rejection of human nature, of human essence. This is called existentialism, where you can make your own reality, right? There is existentialism as a philosophy, and there is existentialism as a lifestyle. So get ready for meta. The metaverse is coming. In a few years, billions of people are going to be living fake lives, married to fake spouses, living in fake houses, Raising fake children. <coughs> it just reminds me, I took a picture of this in a Build-A-Bear. <laughs> oh yeah. This is a picture from Build-A-Bear Workshop. And this is what it says. They wrote this on the top. For the kiddies, you know. You aren't born a bear. You become a bear. <laughs> this is parroting Simone de Beauvoir. A radical, militant feminist. Existentialism is all about you. So a traditional theocentric life, a life of ubudiya to Allah, which is our purpose according to the Quran, which is a high purpose. When the Prophet heard the, uh, the Quran recited back to him, and he was referred to as Abd, he started to weep. This is the highest title of the Prophet in the Quran. I am the servant of Allah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ رَحْمَةِ الْعَلَمِينَ The other verse, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ إِلَىٰ وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ This is the purpose of our creation, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is being replaced with an essentially egocentric life. Egocentric, rather than theocentric, rather than God being at the center. The ego is put in the center, the nafs. It's a very subtle type of idolatry. It's actually called egolatry. Egolatry, the worship of the nafs. And this happens when people impute the unique nature of Allah upon themselves. This is just shirk. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
Have you seen the one who takes his own desires as his God? This is all related to this revolt against normativity and objectivity and this movement towards queer identity. What does queer mean? Unique, different, special, individual. You can't define me, my identity and gender. I am the undefinable, and I'm fluid. I can change whatever I am, depending on what I want to be. I decide what I am. I am whatever I want to be. Laysa ka mithli There's nothing like me whatsoever. This is just idolatry. You know, there's this YouTuber who goes around, he's a 5'9 white guy, right? And uh, so he goes around these college campuses and he goes up to college students that are dropping 100K on an education. You know? Anyway, um, so he goes up to them and says, and she says, can I ask you a question? Yes, am I a woman? And they say, yeah, sure. He's already sure about that? Yeah. And he says, okay, um, am I a six foot five woman? And they go, uh, and he goes, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Yes or no? Am I six foot, am I six foot five woman? They say, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. And then he says, am I a six foot five Asian woman? And they say, yeah, sure. <laughs> and he said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what is going on? You have children in elementary school identifying as animals. They're called furries. So they, they start, they, you know, um, you know, so-and-so, what's the answer to two plus two? Meow. <laughs> and so the teachers are saying, no, you have to answer the question. And then the student goes back to their parents, and the parents complain to the school. My child identifies as a cat. This is really happening. I'm not making this up. And so the, 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 the teacher has to entertain this delusion. And one of the student's parents actually said, you have to put a litter box in the girl's bathroom. This is real. This is what's happening. They start very early. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the ulul al-bab, the people of essential understanding in the Quran. What do they say? مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ You did not create this for nothing. Glory be to you. So save us from the punishment of the fire. So perhaps the central message here is that, that, is that existence has objective meaning. Your life has objective meaning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you're not on social media, even if you don't have any friends, even if two people in the world don't know your name, you mean something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa hasbun Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffices us. We must not let this world deceive us. The only opinion of you that matters at the end of the day is the opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is it. The only opinion that matters is the opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of Ta'if, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was stoned out of the city. He was bleeding. They were abusing him, insulting him, right? And he sat under the tree. We know the story. His only concern was, what is the opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about me right now? This is his only concern, right? So he made that beautiful dua. If this is happening to me and you're not angry with me, فَلَا ubali, Then I don't mind in the least. If the whole world is against you, but Allah is for you, you win. So life is too short to be a salah. We shouldn't be self, we shouldn't be salahs. It's too short. Life goes by quickly. Anyway, I think I should stop here inshallah. We have a couple minutes. I think we pray at eight. So if there's any comments or questions, inshallah, we'll take them. Yes, sir, with the mask, yes. Um, Wa alaikum salam. Should I get the text here? Yeah, I think so. Wa alaikum salam. 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 Wa alaikum
when you're talking about, you mentioned many times, it's all about submission, 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 right? Sub submission to all the kind of uh, However, so in the public philosophy, in many locations, it's always mentioned, Ya Iyuhal Ladina Amen. Not Ya Iyuhal Ladina Islam, Ya Iyuhal Ladina Amen. However, in parallel, uh, in many locations also, mention all of the MBA, Wakani and Muslimi, Wasamakum Muslimi, Wakani and Muslimi. But the conclusion is, it's all about submissions, all the prophets, uh, 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 are Muslim. But at the end, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk to the human, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amin. Jazakallah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I caught a question, but um, I would say that, um, I would say that uh, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intelligent. That's, that's the point I was making in my, in my talk, right? That it's, it's not a type of submission without any type of reason, right? It's a submission that's based on, on dala'ir, on istidlal that it's intelligent to submit, right? It's intelligent to have iman, and iman does not mean blind faith. That's not our definition. That's the definition of these kuffar, okay? Our definition of iman is safety through God, safety by means of God, and this is intelligent. And we can provide evidence that this is intelligent. So that's what I'm, that's, that was what I'm saying. Okay. Um, you mentioned in, uh, in, in your talk about the religions of people from violence, but looking at the history, I mean, there is a lot of wars started by religions, just fought even between between Christian and Christian versus Christians, Christian versus Muslim, Christian against Jews. So, how can you answer that, especially for for students? Yeah. So, I think the uh, it depends on your definition of religion. Um, so, I would say that. Radical ideology is, is really what people is is really the the sort of champion of uh, um, the ideology that's claimed the most lives is just a radical type of ideology. So not necessarily a religion as we understand Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Because if you look at the 20th century, we have secular war, right? We have millions and millions of human beings, innocent human beings, right? And you might say, well, these people, you know, Mao and Stalin and these people, you know, Hitler, Allah Adam, um, Paul Pot, that these people are atheists. And that might be true, but I think they believed in a radical type of ideology. So if you want to call that religion, I would call that a type of religion, right? So really going to compare things, we have to look at, you know, you look at Islam, you look at Christianity, you look at Judaism, yeah, there's been conflict. In the pre-modern world, um, you know, basically you have, uh, you have uh, different empires that are borderless, that are constantly vying for territory. This was the status quo of the pre-modern world. The status quo of the pre-modern world was one of warfare, right? So it's, it's a very different type of world we're living in. So that's why if you read, you know, fatawa of pre-modern scholars, they talk about Darul Islam and Darul uh, uh, Harb. They bifurcate the world into these two, uh, these two divisions because that was the status quo of the world back then. Nowadays, this bifurcation doesn't really work because we, now we have nation states that have borders. Now we have international peace treaties. The status quo of the world should not be one of, of warfare. So it's a completely different world, right? But even with that said, in the 20th century, you have radical ideologies that do not espouse Judaism, Christianity, and Islam who are killing millions, millions upon millions. Right. Um, so that, that's that's how I would I would understand it. Uh, that it's religion, but it's 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 the it's false religion. I just want to say that I think that uh, we have to go for a shot. I just want to say on Dr. Elias Hai, um, a shot of course, 8 p.m. in the prayer hall. And one quick announcement: tomorrow we have a game day because it's a rainy day, and we want families to come out. We'll have board okay. games. We'll have lunch, bring a snack to share, bring some board games, and come enjoy the day at LJC with your families, inshallah. Are we coming back to Um, Dr. Elias Hai, I'm not sure. Um, 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 I'm not sure. Um
Dr. Adi, do you have, if there's, are there more questions? Uh, yeah, the, the Devil's Trap, yeah. Berlinski, Devil's Trap, The Devil's Delusion, something like it's David Berlinski. <laughs> if there are more questions, are you okay to come back after a shot for like 10 minutes? Yeah, sure. If there are more questions, but can I just get a quick hand? Are there more questions from the audience? Okay, you're off the hook. <laughs> I'm off the hook then. <laughs>